Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, the last week or two I've been pretty busy and in aviation we kind of call the state that I find myself in as getting behind the airplane. It's never a good situation to be behind your airplane. I kind of feel that way when it comes to making these videos this week. It seems like I'm trying to get them done the night before they're due to come out, and this is no exception. Fortunately, we have the Flat Earth, because today I was listening to a presentation on Ranty Flatter's channel by somebody named Spurs Chemo, and his presentation was that pressure does not exist. Everything is only related to temperature because temperature is the only thing that we can sense. Whew! I thought I was going to have trouble coming up with a video today. Thank you, Chemo. I am going to show that atmospheric pressure is a complete hoax. And it's just another number that does not apply to the real world. Okay, one thing that I would like to do before Chemo starts making all these assertions is tell you about the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is how gases behave in the real world. If you look at the pressure times the volume, it equals the number of moles times the gas constant times the temperature of the gas. It's a very nice way to interrelate pressure, volume, and temperature. So we'll refer to this as the presentation goes on. And any other assumed constants are just that all assume numbers with zero evidence to back up their assertions. And with zero evidence of these constants, you have to ask, how did they derive a constant pressure of 14.7 pounds per square inch of atmospheric pressure? Well, you know, it's funny that you should ask that. We can thank this gentleman, Torricelli, for our concept of atmospheric pressure. It was his idea that we lived at the bottom of an ocean of air. And like the sea, the deeper we went into that ocean, and towards the surface in our case, the higher the pressure would become. Now why that is interesting to know is because the QNH obviously is... You know, as you can tell, Chemo sped this clip up to the point that the pilot sounded like a chipmunk and his presentation was almost indecipherable. Let me summarize what he said. When you fly an aircraft, one of the things that you do is you set your altimeter to your field elevation when you take off. And that is done by putting in the barometric pressure. Now, that is so that you know how high the pattern uh, altitude is in the local airport. Then you fly along and the next thing that you do when you get ready to land is you get the barometric pressure at the airport that you're landing. The reason for that is that you reset your altimeter to the local field conditions and then you know how high you are above the runway. 14.7 psi of atmospheric pressure was derived from a 33 feet water pressure formula. While it is true that if you go 33 feet under the surface of the water, the pressure doubles from what you feel on the surface. That's not really how they came up with the idea of atmospheric pressure. Torricelli, uh, who described this ocean of air that we were all living in, invented the first barometer. And the way he did it was he took a glass tube that was 1.2 meters long, and then he filled that tube with mercury. And he took the mercury tube and moved it upright while holding his finger over the end of it and keeping the other end in the cup of mercury. And he found that even though a vacuum was forming at the top of that tube of mercury, the atmospheric pressure could push the mercury up 76 centimeters. And that was the atmospheric pressure. Vacuums do not suck. Pressure pushes into vacuums. This was also seen trying to pump water out from mines. And what would happen was, is even though there, it was a suction pump creating a strong suction, they found that they could not pump water any higher than 33 feet. Now here's an interesting thought exercise. If you have a tube that has an internal diameter of one square inch, if you fill that tube with mercury, 76 centimeters of mercury will weigh 14.6 pounds. 33 feet of water will weigh 14.6 pounds. Atmospheric pressure is 14.6 pounds Per square inch. At sea level you start your dive from one and as you descend deeper underwater the pressure and density increases and the volume decreases. Well here is the first of a number of errors that chemo makes. Liquids 
are non-compressible. Their, their mass and their density does not change with pressure. All right. The temperature can go down a little bit as you go deeper into the ocean, and that will cause the fluid to become slightly more dense. But it's not compressible based on pressure. This relationship between pressure, density, and volume stays consistent as you dive. No chemo. The ideal gas law refers to gases, not non-compressible liquids. Gases are compressible liquids are not. At 33 feet deep, you are at two atmospheres. Two atmospheres underwater gives us a pressure reading of 14.7 psi. Now, unfortunately, I don't think chemo has done any diving in the past. Here is a dive chart. The second column from the left is absolute pressure. Notice that at the surface of the water, the absolute pressure is one atmosphere. 33 feet down, it is two atmospheres, and 66 feet down, it is three atmospheres. But atmospheric pressure at sea level is also 14.7 psi. How can this be, you may wonder? Well, Chemo, I don't wonder that, because it's not right. Atmospheric pressure at the surface is 14.7 pounds per square inch. 33 feet below, it's 14.7 from the surface, plus an additional 14.7 for 29.4 pounds per square inch. 33 feet of water is 99 kilopascals, which equals to 14.7 psi. Confused? Well, get your thinking caps on. 33 feet deep underwater is the same pressure at sea level. Yes, you heard me right. Yes, chemo. We heard you right. We heard what you said. What I'm telling you is that you said it wrong. You are incorrect and you do not understand the problem. Now, actually, this presentation on Ranty Flatter's channel by Chemo was really good because it brought up three problems with his thought process. The first one that we've seen, he clearly does not understand dive physiology and the interaction of water depth and pressure. Now we're going to go to the other end of the spectrum, and that is to deal with balloons. High altitude balloons do not burst due to an outside force pressing against the exterior of the rubbery surface, or because it lacks one. As the balloon rises, there is a constant force from the warm gas within the balloon pressing against it. And as it ascends, the rubber begins to freeze, in turn causing the balloon to become a lot weaker and a lot less stable, therefore making it easier for the warm gas to break open the balloon. All right, Chemo made a number of assertions here, all of which are incorrect. And again, he is demonstrating he does not understand the physics involved in this balloon issue. This is Felix Baumgartner in the Red Bull Strato Jump. Now, he ascended to 128,000 feet in about 90 minutes. That's about 1,450 feet per minute. The problem that we're running into with Chemo's assertion that the temperature was the key factor here is this. Number one, this was a high altitude balloon. They are designed to deal with the temperature changes. They're not going to freeze and become brittle. That would defeat their purpose. Second of all, the gas in the balloon was at atmospheric temperature on the ground. As it went up, that temperature equalized with the temperature of the surrounding atmosphere. The only thing standing in the way of that temperature equalization was the insulating property of the material of the balloon, which is very low. So the bottom line is the balloon did not fail due to temperature changes. And oh, by the way, notice that this photograph, which is not taken with a fisheye lens, clearly demonstrates curvature on that horizon. You can clearly see the gas does not rapidly rush to fill the space or void. That's because there is no void to fill. The so-called pressure is the same no matter the height. 
The only thing that changes is the temperature. Now, once again, I don't know if it is a failure of research on the part of chemo or his inability to comprehend things that are outside of his flat earth narrative. On the Red Bull Strato Jump, you see two photographs of the same balloon. The bottom photograph is the balloon just after launch. Notice all of the slack in the balloon. There's just a small amount of gas in the top of a very large balloon. On top, you'll see the balloon at 128,000 feet. You see how it's filled out and stretched? Now, they didn't put more gas in. What happened was the gas that was filled into the balloon at sea level or at whatever the launch site was, expanded due to the decreased pressure in the upper atmosphere to fill out the full volume of the balloon. That's why Felix had to wear a pressure suit, because the gas pressure at that altitude was just a tiny fraction of what it was on the ground. And he, without that suit, he wouldn't have been able to breathe. The molecules will move around freely in any direction until their temperature changes, which will cause them to either fall or rise. No, once again, chemo is confusing the issue here. Temperature does not cause gas to fall or rise. It causes gas to expand or contract. If you increase the temperature of a gas, it will expand. If you decrease the temperature of a gas, it will contract. The temperature in the upper atmosphere is 20, 30, 50 degrees lower than it is on the surface. If anything, the balloon would collapse further as it got colder. It did not. If the pressure increases, it will crush in. If the pressure decreases, it will expand, which is what we saw the balloon do. And it will expand to the point that it will burst. All they give us is lies, lies, lies. They give us data without demonstrations. They give us demonstrations with fraudulent explanations. So I have to ask, do you want a trick or the truth? Trick or truth? Trick or truth? I'm always in favor of the truth. So let's begin there. Well, folks, chemo goes on to misapply the gas law in several other examples. Maybe we'll go over those in another video, but I really think that the point's been made with this one. Chemo does not understand the gas laws. He does not apply them correctly. He doesn't understand dive physiology and pressures, and he's misapplying those as well. This is one of those times that you have to have a look at this and say, do I really want this guy trying to explain things to me that he does not understand himself? I think it's clear that he does not understand them, and I don't think that he's a good source of material for the general public looking at these videos. So. Give me a little help here. Hit that little like and subscribe button down in the lower right corner. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. I hope to see you again real soon. Take care, guys.